जय श्री राधे जय गुरुदेव कॉलिंग फ्रॉम साधुमा आश्रम इन मैथन विद ऑल द मंजरीज अराउंड मी हियर सुदेवी एंड वंदना एंड रसेश्वरी दे आर ऑल हियर विद मी and the instruction of gurudev and by his mercy we begin today a special few weeks of study of chaitanya charitamrita adalila adilila chapter 4 still in the translation of and with the commentary by shila bhakti vedanta swami prabhupad and still with the heart as the starting point feelings as the starting point bhakti as the starting point to help us uh, understand from the heart orient our thinking and our research from the heart and seek our goals from the heart we finished chapter 14 of bhagavad gita and it was a very good time for a pause we covered the most important basic ideas of bhagavad gita and i think we can turn our minds very nicely now to chaitanya charitamrita and return another time which i promise you we return another time to bhagavad gita um i want to i see um there are very highly specialized and talented experts in the class today nonetheless i'm going to try to make a very simple version of of these first verses and of chapter 4 of chaitanya charitamrita adilila very simple in part because it's a it's a different level of understanding than bhagavad gita very simple because many of us have never read it uh and very simple because it's so very important for our practice and this is of course why Guru Dev requested that I uh, take it up and and share with you about it. So my plan is to go very slowly, very sweetly, uh, very nicely, and start today with a simple introduction to uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to Chaitanya Charitamrita, and to this Adi Lila. chapter 5 Chaitanya Charitamrita is a <clears throat> it's a kind of biography of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu but it's a only a kind of biography it's a very special biography because it's not only about the facts of his life there are many interesting facts and it's a very interesting life even if it was a short one 48 years and it's about his ideas so it's about the life and ideas of mahaprabhu but it's also in a much more complex way a story about his heart it's the biography of a soul a biography of a soul which is in an extremely wonderful and strange situation and condition so it's these three things and what's particularly important about it for us is that they come together the life story the ideas the theories and most importantly the very extraordinary soul that chaitanya mahaprabhu was during his time on this earth and which he continues to be of course as a very extraordinary soul uh beyond his time on this earth it's the story of Krishna revealing himself on earth not the first time he he's done it as we know but the most important way he's done it and we'll talk more about this today and as we go on it's the story of the birth of a mood which is a very strange thing to write a biography about the birth of a feeling the birth and the life of a feeling and it's the story of how we can preach and share about a feeling about a way of feeling and finally it's a story about how to be a devotee in this mood all these things come together in this in this extraordinary biography the book communicates in a new way in a different way 
It mixes together facts and ideas and feelings. So it has sometimes language about where Chaitanya was, who he met, what he did maybe. It has a talk about his teaching, his shiksa, which we'll come back to a bit. But most importantly, and I know you'll agree as we come to it gradually, it's about what he experiences in his heart. The extraordinary process by which he realizes that he is Radha Mohan and realizes what kind of shape that will have and what kind of life that creates for him. Chaitanya Charitamrita is a modern biography. It was completed in the 16th century. So for in European terms, this is in the late part of the Renaissance. But more important than that, it was a biography that was uh, written down by a specific, very clear author, Srila Krishnadas Karivaj. So if we want to compare it to Bhagavad Gita or to Srimad Bhagavatam, these two works were spoken and then written down. And if we know who wrote them down, we don't know for sure who spoke them, though we have very clear and strong ideas and opinions and their discussions. But... Uh, this book, Chaitanya Charitamrita, was written in a very modern way, using texts, using books, using notes. It's built partly on the observations written down by a close associate of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu named Murari Gupta for the first half of his life. And then for the second half of his life, the other very important associate and personal secretary who was Svarup Damodai, kept a daily journal of everything that happened uh, in his time together with Ch uh, uh, Lord Chaitanya. And so these were the basis, together with the scriptures, Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads and others, these form the basis for this, this book. So it has a different kind of status than, than uh, the classical Vedic texts. It's written in Bengali, the language which was the language of Chaitanya, the language of the great uh, Bhakti Acharyas. Uh, many of the verses are Sanskrit written into Bengali, like I think all of them today, actually, in the, this uh, first part of the verses we're going to talk about today. But it's written in Bengali, which is a very beautiful musical language, which Gurudev assures me it would be very nice if I'd learned together with my Hindi and my Sanskrit. So we'll, I'll, keep in I'll keep in touch about how this goes. Krishna Das uh, Kaviraj, the, the author, was an associate of Mahaprabhu. He was a devotee of Nityananda Prabhu, and then later of Ravnatas Goswami. The book has three main parts, you, you might know. There's the Adi Lila. Adi means beginning. So it's the pastimes of the first pastimes, the early pastimes. It's the pastimes until he's about 24 years old. Then the Madhya Lila is the second part, means the middle pastimes, the pastimes in the, uh, in the, in the middle of his life. And then the Antya Lila. So basically he divides his life into three parts and the three different kinds of lives, you could also say. So Adi Lila, the first part is when he's a householder and he's actually married and uh, his first uh, wife passes away, but until about 24 when he left, uh, when he took sannyas and left his uh, householder lifestyle. And so Madhya Lila is the time of his traveling, he's sannyas, he's preaching, he's traveling, and then already at, at, during this time, having the ecstatic experiences that we see in, in so many uh, pictures and paintings of him. And then the Antia Lila, when he's uh, only living closely with close devotees in Jagannath Puri, uh, the time of his transcendental madness, as it's called. And then, like I said, he leaves um, his body at age 48. Many... Um, Many scholars put Chaitanya Charitamrita in a 
group with Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And so maybe we can reflect a minute on how they relate to each other. Um, many, well, Gurudev has often said that uh, Vilapa Kusmanjari and Radha Rasa Sudhaniti are, are the PhDs of, of spiritual thought. But others would say that already Chaitanya Charitamrita is PhD. So if we start with Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita teaches us about the life of the soul, about spiritual consciousness, about devotion, about surrender, about our relation to God. It begins, as you might remember, with something like, you are not this body, you are a soul, and that it ends, as you might remember, with Krishna saying, all you need to do is let go of all religion and surrender to me. So Bhagavad Gita is kind of an introduction into the life of the soul, an introduction to Krishna in a little bit, a little bit as well. And then Srimad Bhagavatam is the pastimes of Krishna. And its purpose seems to be to make us form a deeper relationship with Krishna, to uh, get a taste for the pastimes of Krishna. And it teaches us also about his different devotees. It begins with something like reject all immoralities and cheating and uh, go to the essence of things, which is bhakti. And then it ends in Canto 12, talking about how to destroy sinful relations through chanting and purified practice. So with Bhagavad Gita, we learn about the soul in relation to God. In Bhagavatam, we learn more about Krishna and his pastimes. And then finally, Chaitanya Charitamrita tells us about the experience of God, how God is experienced by his devotees, how love is felt by the devotees, what kind of experience of love God has, Krishna and Radha Mohan. It tells about the kinds of relation we can have, the, the life of feeling we can have, the different kinds of attractions. It teaches us about prema, about prem bhakti, and it explains about how devotional life brings us closer to God. It teaches us that prem is the highest form of spiritual life. That is for sure. So the love of God is the highest form of spiritual life. And so high, as we know, that God himself wants it. And this is why uh, he takes the position, the mood, and the standpoint of Radha in order to experience loving God. So we have a crystal clear model for our own lives. Loving God is the highest, so high that even God himself wanted to do it. And that's why, that's why Lord Chaitanya <clears throat> took the mood of Radha in order to have exactly that experience. What about Adilila, chapter four? It's called the confidential reasons for the appearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we're in the early part of the first of the three parts of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Chaitanya is still a young man. There's been some stories about his life, but now we come to two chapters which are at the heart of all of Pem Bhakti. Why did Chaitanya appear? And why is it confidential? What does this mean? We remember in Bhagavad Gita that chapter 9 was called Rajguya Yog, the king of confidential knowledge. And by that, we understood that confidential knowledge was knowledge that could not be known with the mind. It could only be known through the heart. It could not be given through organized religion. It cannot be explained through logic or through science. So this is one way of understanding the title of this chapter, the confidential reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
There are reasons for this appearance that can only be understood through the heart. And the thing that is given is prema bhakti. Only from the heart and through the heart, through feelings, can we understand prema bhakti. There's no book. There's no teaching for it. There's no logic. It's something we experience. It's something that we can only see by example, by association. Later on, in a verse I think we'll have the time to read today, the word antarag is used to describe the reasons for, for the appearance. And antarag is, means essentially internal or spiritual. And so we describe the internal reasons for Mahaprabhu's appearance. We describe the spiritual reasons for his appearance. And these are in three in number. I'll come back to those in a minute. But then if we look back at chapter three, we see that it talks about the external reasons for Chaitanya's appearance. The material reasons, if you like. So in chapter three, we learned, we're not going to read it now, but we learned that he came to share Prema Bhakti, to share Nama Sankirtan, the practice of congregational chanting, and the different ways that we can worship together. So he came to give us, the devotees, the believers, uh, externally, something that we needed, something that we longed for, something that we uh, were desiring. But then in chapter four, the external reasons, sorry, the internal reasons, were, with, were concerned with what he wanted, what he desired what he was seeking. And that is, of course, to understand what it means to love divinely, what plan is. And this will be set out both in the introduction by Prabhupada that we'll read in a minute and in the, in the verses that come after. So for this reason, this chapter is really the beginning of Bhakti Yoga because it's the beginning of Prema Bhakti, the practice of devotion in the service of God, devotional service in, 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 the, in the intent to love God. So it does two things. And I spend a bit of time on this because these two things are, we need to make them harmonize. The one is for the desires of God. The other is for the benefit of the devotees. One is spiritual the other is material. One is internal, the other is external. And there's even another way we can make a difference between them. We could say that the, the internal reasons are part of the Vraj Lila that we read about in Vilapakus Manjari and Radha Rasa Sudaniti, and that the external reasons are part of the Navadvip Lila, the Lila of his younger time, Chaitanya's younger time, and of his association with, uh, with those friends and associates who become part of the Pancha Tattva. But somehow these two go together. He's doing them at the same time. He's preaching uh, Namasan Kirtan. He's preaching devotion. He's acting like a devotee in his life, throughout his life. And at the same time, he's, he's experiencing this internal situation of taking the position of Radha in order to relish the experience of loving God. External consciousness and internal consciousness. Preaching and worshipping, and then experiencing this deeply emotional situation of being split in a way, being in the mood of Radha, but being in the, the body of Krishna. So an internal consciousness and an external consciousness. In the external consciousness, we have him together with Advaita Charya, Nityananda, Karada, Srivasa, so the Panchatvata, Tattva. And then in his internal consciousness, spiritual consciousness, he is intimately involved, in, involved with the, the Goswamis. First with First with uh, Rupa and, and Sanatana, 
and then later with Jiva and uh, Raghunath Patta, Kopala and Raghunathas, as we know. One last point to bring up before we turn to the book, and that's about his teaching. How does he teach? What is his shiksa method? And here too, there are two different personalities to his teaching. He has direct teaching, direct shiksa to Rupa and Sanatana and to Jiva as well. So Rupa and Sanatana are the two main devotees. They're shiksa devotees. And then Jiva Goswami is the nephew, as you might know, of both of these. And he had teaching from them. So there's direct teaching. And there's even parts in Chaitanya Charitamita which talk about this direct teaching and we'll come back to those when we have come along a little bit further. And then there's indirect teaching to the other, the four other Goswamis. So there are Raghunath Bhatt, Jiva, Kopalabhat, and Raghunath Das Goswami. These are not taught directly from Chaitanya Charitani, Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya, sorry. They're taught indirectly through associates, through Rupa and Sanatana, and so on. And when I say they're taught indirectly, I mean also that it's the internal consciousness that's taught, the internal mood that's passed along indirectly, through association with associates, through association with disciples, and so on and so forth. So there's a bit of background for Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now let's look at <coughs> the short introduction that Prabhupada makes of this chapter. For those of you who are very thirsty, there's a long introduction to this, the volume of the Adi Lila, which is very, very good, also by Prabhupada, but it would take us uh, months to read it together. So I think we'll focus on this quite short introduction that's in the beginning of chapter four. It really, it gives us all the main messages of the chapter, and then we can uh, go back and look in a bit more detail uh, after we've had this introduction. Once again, these are the confidential reasons for appearance. They're the internal reason, reasons, the spiritual reasons. These are the reasons that Chaitanya appeared for him for himself. But even when we say that, we can think that what he does for himself, he does for his devotees. So it's, a, it's a problem I, I think a lot about and I want to come back to as well. This difference between external and internal, spiritual and material, is not so clear. That what we do in our spiritual lives has an impact on our material lives, and what we do in our material lives has an impact on our spiritual lives. And that I think we see clearly in the life of Chaitanya Charitamri, of, of Lord Chaitanya. So Chaitanya wanted to relish. That was his main internal reasoning. He wanted to relish the love of God. He wanted to relish Prem Bhakti. And that means he wanted to give love to God through devotion. This is what Prem Bhakti means and to receive love of God as devotion at the same time. He wanted to be the object of love and the lover. He wanted to be Mohan and Radha in the same person. And this is quite difficult for us to imagine, impossible for some of us to imagine. But this is why we use the word ecstasy to describe it, ecstatic. We always say Chaitanya has ecstatic symptoms, or Chaitanya is always in ecstasy. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's an old Greek word. Ex means outside, static means standing. If he's ecstatic, that means he's all, 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 always outside of himself. He's inside himself and outside of himself. So the love he gives, the love he feels, is constantly growing, and it's so great, so rich, and so powerful that it is overflowing himself. It comes out of him. It's ecstatic. 
It's too big to hold inside in his, in his heart, in his feelings. He cannot hold it in. This is what causes what we call ecstatic behavior. His internal consciousness, his spiritual consciousness becomes external. We can see it materially outside. His devotees, his associates could see his feelings on the outside of his body. This is what ecstatic means. So his consciousness as Radha and Mohan, this double, double consciousness flows outside of him. And it makes him look in that special way, the golden shining color that he has, but it also makes his body behave in, in very strange ways. All of this is because this experience of relishing the love, the, the, the love of God is growing endless, endlessly. It's, some, it's a theme we come back to again and again in, in Velap Kusmanjari and the Radha Rasa Sutta Niti. Of all the things that are stable in the universe, the love of God always grows. And so Lord Chaitanya cannot contain this. It flows out over his whole body. In his teaching, in his preaching, he tries to explain how we can serve Radha Mohan, how we can serve this flowing expanding prema, how, how we can do prema bhakti, how to make prema bhakti. And the way we can do it is by assuming the mood of the manjari, the manjari by taking on manjari bhav in our own souls and by uh, copying the manjari bhav we see being lived out in the Goswamis, in the stories we hear in Velap Kusmanjari, told by the Acharyas. So here in particular, it's impossible to think of learning it from a book. It's a kind of experience that we need to learn by association, by duplicating, by copying. And again, what is that experience? It's cultivating, cultivating the love of God. It's cultivating the love that Rara is expressing for her mohan making it always grow, making it always expand. And how do we do that? Well, we can come back to it again later. We should probably stay with the text. But, but what it means for us in our everyday practice is to increase our love for God, increase our love for the divine in others, in our friends, in our partners, in our children, so that this love can grow, this Love for the divine can grow collectively among others, among our, those who are close to us, and that then the love that Radha can carry on to her moan is infinitely growing. How can we be shown the way? Well, we can talk in terms of the Goswamis. And this is what we see when we, when we read Prabhupada. We need Sanatana Goswami to show us about our relationship to Radha Mohan. He is the disciple of relationship. We need Rupa to show us how to carry out Raghunuga Bhakti. And we need Raghunath to show us that the goal is full surrender. So we have three elements, relationship to God, uh, practice, and the goal, which is surrender. And these correspond directly to th the three stages of bhakti practice, sambandha, abhideya, and, and prayojan. Relationship, method, and goal. So Sanatana Goswami represents sambandha, relationship to God. Rupa Goswami represents abhideya, the method or the practice. And Raghunathas Goswami represents prayojan, the goal, which is the ultimate surrender. So in these three Goswamis, we have the ultimate example for our practice of relationship, method, and surrender. All stages of internal development. All stages of um, realizing our, our soul identity, our svarup. So now in his comment... Prabhupada reviews these, the three reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya. So I'm citing the, the text now. The first 
purpose was to relish the position of Srimati Radharani, who is the prime reciprocator of transcendental love of Sri Krishna. So reciprocator means she's the one who can give it back. She can take the prem, which Krishna is the reservoir of, and make it flow back to him. Reciprocate. And this is what Titania wanted to do. He wanted to see what it means, what it feels like to give that love back. So she is the one who's able to give love directly to God. She is the one who's capable of direct prema, direct loving of God. We can support this in Manjari Bhav in a hundred ways, but we can only support it. She is the one who gives divinely. But by giving our support to her, she can give more divinely and we can benefit. We can be, find happiness in that. So the first purpose is for Krishna to take that position and see what it tastes like, see what it feels like, what it means to, to relish it. He depends on that position. He cannot know without her, without Radha, without uh, her mercy, without her letting him take that position. He is unable to understand what prem is, what, how, it is how it is lived, how it is felt. So we need Radha in order to relish, because Krishna needs Radha in order to relish. Our happiness depends on the happiness of Radha, which depends on the pleasure of Krishna. Now Prabhupada says, Lord Krishna is the reservoir of transcendental loving transactions with Srimati Radharani. So he's the reservoir of love. He holds like a pool, like an ocean, all the love in the world. But as we know, he's unable to experience giving the love to the divine. Unable to experience Prem. He holds all Prem, but he can't feel it. He holds all knowledge, but he can't know it. He holds all feelings, but he can't give them. It's only through this loving energy that Radha possesses that he can relish that. So he takes her position. Prabhupada says, the subject of these loving transactions, transactions, so loving exchanges, is the Lord himself. And Radharani is the object. So this means, subject here means enjoyer. He's the enjoyer. He can receive it, but he can't give it. He's the one who feels it, but he can't feel what it is to give it. He can feel what it is to receive it. He can experience being loved, but wants to know what it is to love. I continue. Thus, the subject, the Lord, wanted to relish the loving mellow in the position of the object, Radharani. So the Lord wanted to know what it was to be enjoyed. Not to be the enjoyer, but to be the enjoyed. What to, what to know, he wanted to know what it is to give love. Sorry, he was the enjoyer. He wanted to know what it would be like to be enjoyed, to be the giver of love, to give to the one who's enjoying the love, to make the enjoyer enjoy, <laughs> to put it that way. This is what he wants. This is the, and this is the desire of anyone who loves someone. Let's be clear. We say, I love you. That means I want you, I want to give you my love. I want you to have the love that I feel. I want you to know what I feel. So we need to embrace this experience of mundane love and bring it to a transcendental level, in a, at least in our thoughts. Now Prabhupada continues. The second reason for his appearance was to understand the transcendental mellow of himself. Lord Krishna is all sweetness. Radharani's attraction for Krishna is sublime. And to experience that attraction and understand the transcendental sweetness of himself, he accepted the mentality of Radharani. So just like Krishna is the ocean of love, but that does not give love, he's also the ocean of sweetness, but does not taste that sweetness. 
the transcendental sweetness of himself. So here he wants to take the senses of Radharani so that he can taste what that ocean of love is. He'd like to understand what it means to be so attracted by somebody so beautiful as Krishna, so sweet and so so powerful and full of knowledge. What would it be like to be attracted to that? That's the last pleasure on earth that he's never had. And he depends entirely on Radharani to have it. And then the third, Prabhupada continues, the third reason that Lord Chaitanya appeared was to enjoy the bliss tasted by Radharani. So what can it taste like to taste the pleasure of me? First we had the love, the prem, then we had the sweetness, and now we have the bliss. What is it like to taste this pleasure, taste this happiness, to touch this happiness? This too he wanted to have. So these three experiences, he needed the experience of Radharani in order to have himself. So that, as a consequence of these three, the highest is not to have love, but to love. Not to have sweetness, but to experience sweetness. Not to contain bliss, but to be blissful. This is the meaning of the three conditions, the three reasons for the appearance. Now Prabhupada goes on and says, the Lord thought that undoubtedly Radharani enjoyed his company, and he enjoyed the company of Radharani. But the exchange of the transcendental mellow between the spiritual couple was more pleasing to Srimati Radharani than to Krishna. So we, he wanted to have the pleasure of the exchange. It's not, to, it's not only that Radha is beautiful, Krishna is beautiful, Radha is love, and Krishna is love, Radha is sweetness, Krishna is sweetness, but it's the exchange, it's the flow of these feelings, the flow of the emotions, the giving of the emotion. Prabhupada goes on, Radharani felt more transcendental pleasure in the company of Krishna than he could understand without taking her position. But for Sri Krishna to enjoy in the position of Srimati Radharani was impossible because that com- position was completely foreign to him. Completely foreign to him, says Prabhupada. It's quite remarkable. So Radharani was loving him and could see that and feel that and know what it was to love divinely. She knew what it was to experience Prem. But Krishna himself did not know it was completely foreign to him. He was too busy being loved, being everything, being all knowledge and power and beauty and, and also being all love, but not um, transmitting it, not giving it. Prabhupada says, Krishna is the transcendental male and Radharani is the transcendental female. Krishna is the transcendental ocean of love. Radharani is the transcendental giver of love. Therefore, says Prabhupada, to know the transcendental pleasure of loving Krishna, Lord Krishna himself appeared as Lord Chaitanya, accepting the emotions and bodily luster of Srimati Radharani. So what's challenging about this text it's challenging about, about this story is that Chaitanya has to be two things at once. And when I think about it personally, I think about a very difficult situation. <laughs> Maybe it's my mundane side. But it feels to me like, yes, it's ecstatic. Yes, yes it's love and loving. Being loved and loving at the same time. But it's a, it's a situation of suffering too. It's a suffering, a situation of not being able to close the gap between the lover and the beloved. So that there's this ecstasy, this great joy in Chaitanya that we see and we read about and hear about. But there's also another side of the ecstasy, which is the longing, which is the desire to be one again. Yes, I can break in two so that I can love my other, 
but by loving my other, all I want is to be one with her or with him. And this is the kind of um, pathos, this, this kind of transcendental, beautiful sadness that you see everywhere in the Vrajlilas, in Vilap Kusmanjari. This absolute delight that Radha and Mohan have to find each other again in the bower, which is immediately followed by the anguish of knowing that they will soon be separated. That to love someone, this someone has to be an other. Love to love is not something for one person. There needs to be two. And if there are two, then there's difference. If there's two, there's distance. So there's always the impossibility that goes along with the ecstasy. ecstasy. And this is the experience of bhakti. Always longing, always greedy, always crying, always wanting. This is what divine love looks like. We read about it everywhere. And we see it in the single body of our dear Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya is not one or the other. He's the flow of love between Radha and Mohan, but he's also the love itself. He's the relation between them, but he's the unity too. He's the tension between the two, but somehow he's, he's, uh, they're, they're coming together. So in, in Chaitanya's body, in his life, in his heart, his, in his teachings, there's a, a beautiful and terrible pushing and pulling, attraction, n- nuclear energy attraction, but repulsion too. Pushing, pulling, wanting, going, coming, desire, disappointment. These are the stories we read in the Vrajalila. Everywhere, in every verse of the Lapakus Manjari, we have, we have this. But this is permanent for Chaitanya. This is the ecstasy he lived, crying and laughing. It's like the sparks that come up between electrical wires when you touch them together. They come together and then you pull them apart and they spark. It's this kind of energy. This is Chaitanya's experience of loving, of this in between this, all love, but in particular divine love means there's a space in between. And for Radha Mohan, it's the space between two, uh, two gods, two infinite beings, two transcendental beings. Okay, we just about finished this introduction now. And Prabhupada continues, and he says, Lord Chaitanya appeared in order to fulfill these confidential desires, and also to preach the special significance of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and to answer the call of Advaita Prabhu. Advaita Prabhu, you might know, is one of the Panchatattva, and he is said to be the one who called Krishna to appear in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It was Advaita who said, you better get back here quick, we need you. Prabhupada continues, these were secondary reasons. Sri Svarup Damodaga Goswami was the principal figure among Lord Chaitanya's confidential devotees. The records of his diary have revealed these confidential purposes of the Lord. So like I said before, uh, Svarut Amada was the secretary for the second part of Chaitanya's life and was there every moment of his revelations, of his ecstasy, of his suffering, and the moment he left as well, was with him at uh, Jabhanath Puri. So a large part of the, the, um, the Madhya Lila and the Antya Lila are, are based on Damadar's um, diaries. And finally, Prabhupada concludes, these revelations have been confirmed by the statements of Sri Rupa Goswami in his various prayers and poems. So this means essentially that what Damodha and others have written down as history, as biography, they are confirmed by the spiritual writings of Rupa Goswami in his prayers and the poems, and I suppose also the theater he, he wrote. So the spiritual experience 
of Prem Bhakti, the experience of Radha and Mohan in the Vraj Leela, is a reflection, according to Rupa Goswami, is a reflection of what actually happened in the life of Chaitanya, as it was written down by Swarup Tamarad. So somewhere there's a, a meeting place between the mundane worldly Leela, the Navadvip Leela, as I said before, and the Vraj Leela. That is life of a preacher in a material body, showing ecstatic signs of ecstasy, harmonizes perfectly with the life of Radha and Mohan living out this drama of coming together and being apart and coming together and being apart. Finally, Prabhupada says, this chapter also specifically describes the difference between lust and love. The transactions of Krishna and Radha are completely different from material lust. Therefore, the author has very clearly distinguished between them. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Adilila. Shri Chaitanya Prasadana Tadupasya Nayam Balopi Kuruta Shastram Drishitva Vraja Vilasinaha. And Prabhupada translates, by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even a foolish child can fully describe the real nature of Lord Krishna, the enjoyer of the pastimes of Raj, according to the vision of the re revealed scriptures. By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even a foolish child can fully describe the real nature of Lord Krishna, the enjoyer of the pastimes of Raj, according to the vision of revealed scriptures. So thanks to Chaitanya, even a child can understand and describe the nature of Krishna, the nature of Radha Mohan. It's so simple. Or perhaps we could say, for a child, it's so natural. Here's what Prabhupada comments. One can ascertain, one can understand the meaning of this Sanskrit shloka only when one is endowed with the causeless mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Sri Krishna, being the absolute personality of Godhead, cannot be exposed to the mundane instruments of vision. He reserves the right not to be exposed by the intellectual feats of non-devotees. So it's really referring to the last verse of the, the last chapter about the external reasons for the appearance. The true nature of Krishna, the verse says, as it is expressed here, is not to be understood intellectually, logically. It has to be understood through mercy. It has to be passed along through loving relation, through association. And it's only in that way can we, that we can understand the very special qualities of Chaitanya. So without the taste, without the taste of the devotee, taste of love of the devotee, understanding is not possible. Without seeking that, that loving relationship, understanding is not possible. We have to both want to, to taste the emotion and we have to exceed, succeed in tasting the emotion. We have to feel. So the mercy the verse talks about, by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, it says, the mercy means the opening of Chaitanya's heart to the reader. Already the purpose of this book, the purpose of this chapter, is to open Chaitanya's heart to the reader, to let us get a glimpse, a tiny peek, a tiny look into the miraculous soul of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So complex, so beautiful, so loving. Uh, and even a child then, if he has this mercy of Mahaprabhu, can, can understand anything. Or like I said, maybe the child already understands because it's a child. One more line from Mahaprabhu now. Notwithstanding this truth, which means even if this is true, even a small child can easily understand Lord Krishna and his transcendental pastimes in the land of Vrindavan, 
by grace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So once we have a drop of this mercy of Chaitanya, we can understand everything he did, all his pastimes, all his life. It will all come together and make sense. Verse 2 is a very famous verse. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Sorry. <laughs> Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda All glory to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All glory to Lord Nityananda. All glory to Shri Advaita Acharya and all glory to all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. So, of course, Nityananda and Advaita Acharya are the other two associates in the Panchatattva. Verse 3. Chaturta Shlokera Arta Kaila Vivarana Panchama Shlokera Arta Suna Bhaktagana Translation by Prabhupada. I have described the meaning of the fourth verse. Now, O devotees, kindly hear the explanation of the fifth verse. So this confused me for a long time. He's referring to the fourth verse of the last chapter where he talked about the external reasons for the appearance. Verse 4. Mula shlokara arta karita prakasha arta lagaite age kaya abasa. Translation. Just to explain the original verse, I shall first suggest its meaning. Arta, meaning. Verse 5, Chaturta Shlokara Arta E Kailasara, Prema Nama Prachitra Aya Avatara. Translation, I have given the essential meaning of the fourth verse. This incarnation, in other words, Sri Taitanya Mahaprabhu, descends to propagate the chanting of the holy name and spread love of God. So these are the external causes namely to, to descend and to preach, to give Nam Samkirtan and, and Prem Bhakti, Bhakti to the devotees. Verse 6. Satya ahetu kintu eo bahiranga ara eka hetu suna ake antaranga. Although this is true, this is but the external reason for the Lord's incarnation. Please hear one other reason, the confidential reason for the Lord's appearance. So now we're coming back from the chapter three with the external reasons, the material reasons for him to come, to give uh, Nam, Nam San, Sankirtan and Prem Bhakti, and going to the internal reasons, the spiritual reasons, namely the, the three ways of taking the position of Radha, Radharani. I repeat now, although this is true, this is but the external reason. And here the term used is Bahiranga, Hetu, the external reason, which in Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere we translate as the material reason. So in my material existence, in my material life, what I needed to give to those outside of my body were these was the Nam Sam Sankirtan and Prima Bhakti. Please hear one other reason, the confidential reason. And here the, the term is Antaranga, which we use in Bhagavad Gita and other places to say spiritual reason. So Bahiranga and Antaranga are external or material and internal or spiritual. Now Prabhupada says, in the third chapter, fourth verse, it has been clearly said that Lord Chaitanya appeared in order to distribute love of Krishna and the chanting of his transcendental holy name, Hare Krishna. So this is the material or the external reason. And Prabhupada goes on, that was the secondary purpose of Lord Chaitanya's appearance. The real reason is different, as we shall see in this chapter. So Prabhupada says there's a secondary reason and there's a first reason. There's a real reason and there's a less real reason. Uh, we don't want to contradict Prabhupada. I would never think of doing that. But I feel as well that um, 
that this external reason, this desire to give the Nam Sam Sankirtan and the Prema Bhakti, flows from the internal spiritual reason, so that they go together. This desire to, this desire to experience love of the divine flows out into the needs to preach this love of the divine to the devotees. So it's this internal ecstasy in the relationship between Radha and Mohan that makes the external appearance uh, necessary and meaningful. Chaitanya was a brilliant man, a scholar. He was an excellent preacher. He was a wonderful singer. And he was in ecstasy. And, and I feel that these things go closely together. They, they don't need to be separated so strictly. That the external beauty, the external sensuality, the external elegance of his preaching and his arguing and his scholarship, they go closely together with his internal experience. And I think this is lived out in mundane life in many different ways. Verse 7. Purve yena priti vira bara hari bara Krishna avitirna haila shastrete prechara. Translation The scriptures proclaim that Lord Krishna previously descended to take away the burden of the earth. Prabhupada will explain this in a, in a minute, but this is not the first appearance of Krishna as we know. He came earlier in other yugas. Verse 8. Svayam bhagavanera karmanahe bhara harana. Shtiti karta vishnu karana jagat palana. Translation. To take away this burden, however, is not the work of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The maintainer, Lord Vishnu, is the one who protects the universe. Again, we'll come back to this again, but we hear there's a difference being made between Vishnu as the, the manager of the universe and Krishna as the supreme creator of the universe. But it, this will come up again in a few verses here. Verse 9, Kintu Krishnera Yei Haya Avatara Kala Bhara Harana Kala Tate Haila Mishala. Translation, but the time to lift the burden from the Bhagavad Gita, sorry, for the burden of the world, mixed with the time for Lord Krishna's incarnation. So here is the, the difference coming in. But the time to lift the burden of the world mixed with the time for Lord Krishna's incarnation. So the task of Vishnu is coming together and getting mixed up with the task of Krishna. And this now Prabhupada will explain in his comment. We have information, he says, from the Bhagavad Gita that the Lord appears at particular intervals to adjust a time-worn spiritual culture. Lord Shri Krishna appeared at the end of the Dvapara Yuga, the last one, the last Yuga, 8,000 years ago or something. He appeared in order to regenerate the spiritual culture of human society and also to manifest his transcendental pastimes. So that's the Dvapara Yuga. And it's when all the events of the Mahabharata took place. They were in this previous Yuga. Prabhupada continues... Vishnu is the authorized Lord who maintains the created cosmos. And he is also the principal deity who makes adjustments when there is improper administration in the cosmic creation. But Sri Krishna, being the primeval Lord, appears not in order to make such administrative adjustments, but only to exhibit his transcendental pastimes and thus attract the fallen souls back home, back to Godhead. In other words, Vishnu is the manager. He's the one who's cleaning up the mess. He's fixing up things in the material plane. But Krishna appears in order to inspire, in order to show his transcendental pastimes, in order to strengthen our spiritual life, 
in order to strengthen our, our faith. Prabhupada goes on, however, the time for administrative rectification, correcting, and the time for Lord Krishna's appearance coincided at the end of the last Dvapara Yuga. Therefore, when Sri Krishna appeared, Vishnu, the Lord of Maintenance, merged with him because all the plenary portion, portions and parts of the Absolute Personality of Godhead merged with him during his appearance. They came together in the same form. Vishnu uh, absorbed into Sri Krishna and they did their two different tasks within the same incarnation. The one is maintenance of the universe, Vishnu's task, and then the other, the transcendental pastimes, which is Krishna's past, uh, task. Yes. Verse 10. Purna Bhagavan Avatara Yei Kale Ara Saba Avatara Tante Ashimile Translation, when the complete Supreme Personality of Godhead descends, all other incarnations of the Lord meet together with Him. Voilà. So Krishna is the Supreme Lord. If there are any other divine tasks to be carried out, these can be carried out in the same appearance. And now here's a bit more detail about that point. This is two verses together, 11 and 12. Narayana Chatur Vyuha Matsyadya Avatara Yuga Manvantara Vatara Yata Acheara Sabeya Ashi Krishna Angahaya Avatina Aicha Avatara Krishna Bhagavan Purna Lord Narayan the four primary expansions, Vasudev, Sankarsan, Pradyuman, Pradyuman, Pradyumna, and Anuruddha, Matsya, and the other Lila incarnations, the Yuga avatars, the many Antara incarnations, and the Man Antara incarnations, and as many other incarnations as there are, all descend in the body of Lord Krishna, in this way, they complete the Supreme Godhead. Lord Krishna himself appears. So when need be, if there are multiple things that need to be done in the material world, then they all appear together, is the, is the purport. 13. Ateva Vishnu Takan Krishna Rasharire Vishnu Dvara Kara Krishna Asura Samare. Translation. At that time, therefore, Lord Vishnu is present in the body of Lord Krishna, and Lord Krishna kills the demons through him. I'm trying to go through these verses so we can get back to the, the three reasons which come here in a few more verses. Verse 14. Anushanga karma ai asura marana. Ye lagi avatara kahise mula karana. Thus, the killing of the demons is but secondary work. I shall now speak of the main reason for the Lord's incarnation. At last. Prema rasa niriasa karita asvadana raga marka bhakti loka karita pracharana razika sekara krishna paramakaruna the Lord's desire to appear was born from two reasons. The Lord wanted to taste the sweet essence of the mellows of the love of God, and he wanted to propagate devotional service in the world on the platform of spontaneous attraction. Thus, he is known as supremely jubilant and as the most merciful of all. So here we have lots of nectar, I think. I'll read again. The Lord's desire to appear, Lord Chaitanya's desire to appear, or Krishna's desire to appear as Lord Chaitanya, was born for two reasons. He wanted to taste the sweet essence of the mellows of love of God, Premaras. He wanted to propagate devotional service, Bhakti, 
in the world on the platform of spontaneous attraction, Raga Marg. Thus, he is known as supremely jubilant, Rasika Shekara, and as the most merciful of all. It's really wonderful because yesterday in morning class, we read the word Rasika Shekara, which in Radha Rasa Sudhanidhi is translated by Advaita Das as king of relishers. So Shekara is crown. So Rasika, the crown of Rasika. And here Prabhupada translates as, as supremely jubilant. We can go with both. He's supremely jubilant and he's the king of relishing Ras. Rasika Shekara. What this also means is that in Chaitanya Charitamrita here we're already deeply in the Vraj Lila. It actually comes up several times in the Radha Rasa Sudha Niti. Razika Shekara, the king of relishers, the one who relishes the most. Um, now commentary from Prabhupada. During the period of Lord Krishna's appearance, the killing of Asuras or non-believers, such as Kamsa, Jarasandha, was done by Vishnu, who was within the person of Sri Krishna. Such apparent killing of Lord Sri Krishna took place as a matter of course and was an incidental activity for him. So this goes back to the double tasks of Krishna and Vishnu. But now the real purpose of Lord Krishna's appearance was to stage a dramatic performance of his transcendental pastimes at Vrajbhumi, Vrindavan thus exhibiting the highest limit of transcendental meadow in the exchanges of reciprocal love between the living entity and the Supreme Lord. So here again, it's kind of complicated in Prabhupada's words. The real purpose for the appearance of Chaitanya was to stage, was to show something, was to show the devotees what it looks like to be enjoying transcendental love, what it looks like to be enjoying Prem, what it looks like to be in Prem Bhakti. He wanted to show externally to us, to his, to, to his disciples, to the people he met on the street when he was doing Kirtan. He wanted to show what the highest possibility for relishing love could be. So once again, this idea that what is happening inside him in his spiritual world, on the spiritual level, this is what he wants to show with his body, with his sankirtan and with his, with his preaching. Those who are not um, in a devotional relationship with him cannot understand this. So he has to show it in a limited way, a concrete way, by singing, by sankirtan, by preaching. So no one in the material world who's not completely unified with him in the spiritual world can understand. So he has to do two things at once. He lives out the relishing on the spiritual plane and he tries to show what relishing might look like on the, on the material plane. Prabhupada continues now. These reciprocal exchanges of mellows are called Raga Bhakti, or devotional service to the Lord in transcendental rapture. This is what's mentioned in, in the verse. Lord Shri Krishna wants to make known to all, to all the conditioned souls, that he is more attracted by Raga Bhakti than by Vaidhi Bhakti, or devotional service under scheduled regulations. So this is the purpose of acting out ecstatically on the streets, in his wor worshipping, in his preaching. He wants to show that there's something more that cannot be controlled by the rules of Vaidhi Bhakti. That something spontaneous is both possible and meaningful, even if it can't be understood with logics. This is very hard to do. I think if I should start speaking to you uh, backwards, or in an unlogical way, trying to convince you of the truth of prema bhakti, you would say he's crazy, 
or he, you would say he's making no sense, or he's a fool. But if I begin to prove to you logically the truth of prema bhakti, it would be corrupting prema bhakti. So this is why the life of Chaitanya is so special that he was completely um, coherent spiritually, internally, completely truthful internally, and completely truthful externally, but in two different ways. Externally through his ecstatic behavior, internally through his continuous practice of Prem Bhakti. It's a heroic act to know what he knows and to still live together with men and women and to try to teach it. It's not something that Krishna could do. It's not something that Krishna ever did. He lived amongst us, but he couldn't teach Prema Bhakti that way. It was only by uh, incarnating in someone where Prema Bhakti was continuously going on and somebody who had the ability to speak and preach and sing, do Nam Sankirtan in a way that could, could communicate this. Prabhupada continues and then we'll conclude with this commentary. It is said in the Vedas, uh, in the Taitiriya Up Upanishad, Raso Vai Sha, Raso Vai Saha. Very famous line, it means, He is Ras. In other words, God is Ras, He is God. Prabhupada gives it a longer translation. He, he translates, the absolute truth is the reservoir for all kinds of reciprocal exchanges of loving sentiments. The absolute truth, which Gurudev comment, commented so, so richly in the introduction to, uh, to Bhagavatam, the absolute truth is this reservoir of ras, which is all exchange of loving sentiments. It's not a simple God who controls. It's not a simple God who is Ras. It's a God that is made of the exchange. Ras is the name of the exchange of loving sentiments. It's not like a pot of honey that you can have or not have. Ras is the name of the exchange, and this is absolute truth. Prabhupada now, he is also causelessly merciful and he wants to bestow upon us this privilege of Rag Bhakti. Thus he appeared by his own internal energy. This is the gift that Chaitanya wanted to give us, this truth, he is Ras. He is this place, this space, where loving exchange can happen. True, pure loving exchange can happen. This exists, this is God, and this is available to you. This is, that is the, that is the preaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Last word from Prabhupada, he was not forced to appear by an extraneous force, which means he's not the object of, bhak of Vaidhi Bhakti. He wasn't there because he had to. He was there because the spontaneous love which emerged in this pool of Ras gave him the gave him the desire to do that. It's a spontaneous appearance, a spontaneous desire to share this prema bhakti. And with that, I think we'll stop. Jai Jai Shri Rade, Jai Jai Shri Rade, Jai Jai Shri Rade.